Hey, to the point listeners, we want to thank you one last time for helping make 2020 an awesome year for the to the point home services podcast. We are stoked to kick off 2021 and get right back to it with some exciting new guests. It just felt fitting to start off this new year with a brand new podcast intro. We hope you enjoyed this episode with my man from Cool Today down in Southern Florida with Jamie D. Domenico. This is To The Point. A Rhino experience. Voted one of the top home services marketing and operations podcasts. Cutting through the bullshit and getting to the point. Hey, what's up, listeners? It's the host of To The Point Home Services Podcast, Chris Yano, along with my co-host, the six-foot-eight stud himself, Mr. Tall Paul Redman. Chris, you keep, you keep getting more like gratuitous when you introduce me, and I'll tell you what, man, it flatters me every time and catches me off guard. So, hey, man, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. I'm sure you did. I actually know if you did because we've talked since this has aired, but good to be back in the studio. <laughs> I don't think I ever would ever put tall Paul and stud in the same sentence. So it just happened. It's like a Christmas miracle. It is. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, listen, I'm excited today and we are going to cut to the point. We're going to get to the point because this is a topic that has come up many, many, many times. So for those who don't know, um, and might be listening for the first time, I'm the CEO of a company called Rhino Strategic Solutions, which is a digital marketing company for the trades since 2008. I've been in, in the trades trying to drive residential leads for home services companies for almost 13 years. Holy shit, that's a long time of working in the trades, and I had no interest in getting into it in the first place, and here I am 13 years later. I got sucked in, and now here I am. And, and the company's kind of like a teenager. Like, we've made it through kind of the awkward years, and now we're like, you know, almost adults, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it started with me and my wife, and now here we are 100 you know, people later and still crushing it all over the United States, Canada. Shout out to our Aussies that came on board. You know, I mean, it's pretty cool. It's been a fun ride. But it's because, uh, you know, we focused on the trades. And part of what Rhino is all about is giving back to uh, the trades as much as we possibly can, whether we do it or we don't. And, and why we started this podcast is because we can't work with everybody. Like, we hit a saturation point, and we can't work with everybody. So this was another way for us to give back, and it was to bring others on, um, you know, industry leaders who've been extremely successful, who are giving, who've been thoughtful, who are helpful, who run successful, you know, trades companies, and have them share kind of some of the things that they've done that made them successful. Um, and our guest today has certainly uh, done that. Um, I saw him, I mean, gosh, actually, Jamie, I think the first time you and I met officially was... I was in, I can't remember if I was in Florida for like a carrier meeting, a dealer meeting down there speaking. I ran into you. Um, I think well, is there like a uh, gosh, what are those? What are those big resorts? There's one that's in Nashville, but there's also one in Florida. Or maybe it was in Nashville. Gaylord Palms. Gaylord, that's yep. what it was. Orlando. I don't remember what meeting I was there for because I've been to so many over the years. But I met you for the first time, and I think um, now you know Tim Crop, right? Yeah. So I'm pretty sure I was working with, I was, um, Tim Crop was a customer, Crop Metcalf, um, amazing mm -hmm. company, amazing guy. Um, and I think somehow I feel like there was a connection there where he's like, Hey, let Jamie know that you're working with, with us. And I can't remember how that went down, but anyhow, you and I met then. Um, yeah. and they, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was at the game. I'm sure it was, uh, it was, I think it was an ACCA event or something like that. That might've been it. About and, six, six, seven years ago. That's that, that's probably actually about accurate. Well, anyhow, I knew of you well before that because of, of the success of the business and just mutual you know um, friends that we've had in the industry, um, and I've always been you know super um, you know impressed um, by everything I've ever heard about you and how you ran your business, and it's been a successful path. And I'm excited for you to share some of it for maybe our listeners who have not heard of Jamie Dimanico. But let me go ahead and give you a proper introduction. He's the president and CEO of Cool Today, which is down in Sarasota, Florida, Florida, um, Paul. That's wow. You see where he got that name I, from now? I, I do. See? Yeah, yeah you like that? Please never do that again. <laughs> You're Sorry, welcome. Kids. Well, welcome from Cool Today, Mr. Jamie D. Domenico. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate you inviting me. It's going to be a good time today, Jamie D. Are you ready? Yes. Wonderful. I can tell. He's ready. He's got his collar shirt on. He's looking good. I think that that's kind of your collar, man. Make sure you, your tan just pop out that much more. <laughs> Lime green. <laughs> Looking good. Like all no our collar, no dollar. On brand. It means business. On brand. Um, well, so today's episode, 
We don't normally give the name of the episode ahead of time, but this one is pretty straightforward. And I want you to listen and listen to me really, really good. How I grew my business 23 million with service agreements, memberships, you whatever you want to call it. That was 23 million, right, Paul? 23 that's right. Million. Yeah. So um, that's actually possible. Now, it's not like you get that overnight, right? Like there's some things you've got to do to get it done. And there's some you know, some consistent things that you have to do. There's things that you have to try that you may not be trying right now. You have to be willing to make changes in your business and implement them and give it a try. You know, and, and the purpose of having Jamie on today was to kind of share what his path was um, and how he turned that into such a great revenue generator for his business. So I want to get right into it. And uh, Jamie, number one, congrats, man, on such a successful journey. And uh, thank you. And obviously, um, kind of where you're at. I know where you're at today. And I don't want to spoil that. But um, and the part of the, you know, the bigger family you've, you, you've you've gotten into, and I'm you know I'm friends with these guys. But yeah. I want to uh, our listeners to be able to take away how in the hell does somebody grow their business an extra twenty three million or heck ten million or whatever by utilizing maintenance agreements. So, but let's start here. Uh, let our listeners know kind of how you got into the trades in the first off, because I always like to know how everybody get into it, because it seems like a lot of people I, I've met that aren't, or like whose family isn't in the business, didn't even mean to get into the business, and they ended up in it. That's how I ended up in this thing. But in regards to you, how did you get into trades? And then go ahead and let everybody know where you're at, like, today. Okay, great. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, I had no family in the business, and it was a complete accident. So those two no we have in common. Uh, except... I got into the business almost 40 years ago and you were whining about 13 years. So <laughs> talk to me in about 27 years. Fair enough. If I'm still around. Um, so I got into about 40 years ago, I actually dropped out of college in New York and I came down to Florida to start a new uh, life. Um, like most New Yorkers. Um, and uh, I got a job working the night shift at a uh, heating, plumbing, air conditioning and electrical contractor. They sold, uh, service contracts, full home service contracts, labor materials, everything, kind of like a warranty, home warranty. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I am probably, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm probably the minority. I, I never turned a wrench. Um, most of your um, guests have uh, started their own company and they worked in the field and they sold and all that stuff. Uh, I never turned a wrench. I went in, I went into uh, warehousing, then I went into accounting, then I went into operations. And so I've done just about every job that supports the field. That's I why that. I respect the field so much. I love that. And uh, so I had an opportunity uh, to leave uh, Service America. That was the name of the company at right. the time to join Blue Dot in 1998. And then um, some fellow uh, Service Americans uh, followed me like Paul Kelly, uh, Ken Haynes. Um, it's names that you recognize. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So we, uh, we started blue dot, we grew it. And then, um, the parent company went, uh, belly under because of some bad investments. So they had to sell all those individual companies back. So when they sold those companies back, people like Ken and Paul and myself got an opportunity to buy right. some of the companies. And I bought a little company in Sarasota, Florida called N and M. Uh, and, my partner was, uh, Ken Haynes and I had another partner. Uh, named Tom Wells, who owns, um, who's part owner of Williams Comfort. Era. That's right, Williams. Yeah. Yep. So we're it all, all kind comes of, back. So we're all kind of connected. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a little family. This this hundred billion dollar industry is a little family. Oh, it's wild. Um, so uh, so I I bought it. We had seventeen employees and um, uh, really worked hard at growing it. I had a uh, 15, 20 year plan to grow it. So I, I, I believe in a 1968 Harvard study that says people who write down their goals, their long-term goals, and they work those goals every day are, you know, 900 times more uh, successful than people who don't write down any goals. So we had a 15, 20 year plan, people plan, operations plan, financial plan, and this, we worked the plan and somewhere around uh, 2010, sorry for the background noise with the months, COVID. Um, somewhere around 2010, um, I joined Nexstar and I had some Nexstar friends come in and uh, they were very impressed with the number of agreements I had, maintenance agreements. And that started my, I was very focused on them in the first place, but then I realized I really wasn't that good. And it, it made me crank it, crank it up from there. So 
I had about 5,500 in 2010. Nice. So, uh, but when I looked at all the opportunities I get every single day um, with our with our new customers and our customers who use us don't have agreements, I realized I was really only converting about 12% of the opportunities. So my goal was to get that to 40%. Um, so I started out in a business really in a supporting role. I had an opportunity to, to purchase a company in 2004. We grew it to 38 million. Um, and then I sold it to the wrench group, um, which I think you've interviewed Ken Haynes, really super guy. Oh, yeah. He's been a 30 year friend of mine, um, sold to the wrench group in uh, March of 2019 and, uh, we kept, kept growing because I, this year we're just shy of 50 million. Yeah. Uh, 2020. So cool, man. Yeah. Ken, great guy. He's been on here too. I have a good friendship with Ken Haynes. Um, he's actually bought like four of my custom, five of my customers, <laughs> Um, but just shows you the caliber that we're working with too, um, because Ken is a caliber guy. Um, and I, and I thought that it was, uh, when I heard that you guys had, uh, you had sold, um, what that really means is you just set yourself up for another big spurt in growth, I think, cause the support is amazing from wrench group. Um, and I love kind of some of the principles behind it all. Like I think, remember Paul and Ken was on, he talked about, he made like 50 millionaires or something like that. Like that's a pretty cool legacy I think to have. Um, Yeah. yeah, I think it was over 50 millionaires that weren't millionaires. Something. Yeah. yeah, That's forget about us owners that sold companies. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, We're talking about service (laughs) managers and the like. That's that's what makes that model. uh, That's what make the model so cool. But the other thing is they're very focused on relationships like I am. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I know you, uh, you intro the top of the line, 23 million that was really a, probably a year or two ago. Um, I haven't measured it this past year, but I think it's going to be closer to 28 Man. million this year. That's and um, what uh, what revenue you derive from your agreements versus your non-agreement customers is something that uh, most of business owners should be interested in. You know, mm-hmm. how do you, what makes your company successful besides the people that you have employed? What are the key characteristics the drivers of revenue, the drivers of, of opportunities, right? You know, um, so um, in 2010, when I, when I invited the uh, group over, I realized, you know what, I should be at like eight or 9,000. And that's when I turned up the afterburners and grew my uh, agreement base to, by the time I sold, I think we were at uh, 16,000 service agreements. Today we're pushing on 20,000 service agreements. So we went from 5,000 service agreements in 2010 to 20,000 in 2020. And I guess if you just look at topical reference, in 2010, we did about uh, 15 million. That was with a lot of government stimulus, by the way, and and, um, AC units, $1,500. So call it 15 million today, we'll do 50 million. So the, and, and it's not all marketing right the marketing dollars and stuff like that because everybody has a budget but it's what you derive through uh your channels and your existing loyal customers are your best channel for revenue dollars this is all this is all sarasota and the surrounding area like how far north are you going you're not going like clear up into you know tampa and stuff like that you're kind of going is no we're in tampa now Uh, i started in tampa about about a year or two before i sold okay and um bought a little company two little companies up there. Um, we've acquired six companies along the way Got and it. integrated them. Okay. Um, and then uh, re- this year, this past year, we bought another little company in Tampa with through wrench and we bought a company in Naples, Florida called Florida cool. So we're now from Naples to Tampa, but the Tampa market and Naples market is, you know, probably about 30% of our business. Florida cool. Was actually old, Florida cool was actually an old customer of ours. Um, oh, Tom Caprio. Yeah. Like, um, God, it's probably been five years ago. Um, maybe, maybe more. I don't know. No, actually, it's probably closer to six years. Going to think about it. Um, wow. Because of our relationship with Carrier. Um, yeah. Yep. So yeah. interesting. Well, yeah. one, this is fantastic. So I didn't realize you did so many acquisitions in that path. Um, Paul, what were you going to say? I don't. I just I cut you off. I'm just no. You're fine. I'm just chomping at the bit on the maintenance agree or service agreements. Um, couple questions. You you just mentioned kind of turning up the afterburners. What did that look like? What was the lever you pulled? Was it kind of internal discipline? Was it marketing? Mm-hmm. What was it? Great question. 
Um, both, most, mostly, uh, okay. An old, uh, when I worked for Rotorooter, an old manager of mine who was my boss said, um, if you don't measure it, you're not managing it. Mm -hmm. And most, it, it starts with most of the companies uh, out there in, in the home service business today don't even measure uh, their, their conversion rate on selling agreements, their renewal rates on keeping customers, um, their attrition rate. They don't, they don't put it up on poster boards. They don't, they don't have contests, rewards. They don't, they don't give it any focus, probably because it's not strong within their belief system. Mm -hmm. So for me, my belief system is my co company is about relationships, relationships with the customers, the relationship with the employees and relationship with the community. So that's our, that's our three legged stool, so to speak. Right. Um, but that is the tripod of success for us. And the key word is relationship, lifelong relationship. So if you're going to have a relationship and you're going to measure customer loyalty, how do you measure it? really the best way to measure it is those customers who are willing to either pay a monthly fee or an annual uh, renewal to uh, keep your people coming to their home to make sure their home um, air conditioning, plumbing, and electrical systems are running in tip-top shape. So in an orientation, I tell them, what can you, well, this is work, great benefits, great pay, great opportunity. Those are the things I'm promising you. The only thing you have to promise me is take care of our customers and believe in a mission, which is relationships. So it starts with an expectation, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a focus. The leader, whoever the leader is of that organization, has to have it in their mind that relationships with the customers are most important thing, right? And so if you're going to do that, you have to make sure you're measuring your most impor important product, not by revenue, but just by the opportunity to get revenue. And that is maintenance agreements. So um, it starts at orientation and it starts uh, with uh, accountability, right? Because if I have a technician that goes into, uh, I don't know, let's say 500 new homes this year, right? And they sell about 30 agreements. And I have another technician that goes in 500 new homes and they sell 200 agreements. Which technician am I going to keep busy in the winter? The one that doesn't believe in it? and still wants to get calls. I mean, right now here in Florida, we're 70 degrees. Very nice out, by the way. We're a little chilly last night, probably about 50. Um, but that's not air conditioning weather. And we still have over 100 calls on the board. Nice. And they're all our relationship customers, our maintenance agreement customers. So accountability counts, right? And then rewards and recognition, right? So. You, so sometimes com some companies do certain aspects of it. They don't. They don't hit all the, the all the key points of performance, right? I mean, in high performing organizations, the key points of performance are tracking, recognition, accountability, and review, right? And if you if you're doing those things, you're going to have success. I mean, you. I mean, you look at even just take some model sports teams like the the Patriots before this year, right? They certainly had those things and they weren't like individually, they weren't like super talents. Of course, we know Brady is a super talent, but they they were so good at, at just executing, right? And they used those principles. Is my light bothering you guys? Right? No, no, you're fine. Um, before we move on, because there's so much to talk about here, pardon me, Chris, I know I interrupted you. Um, can you break down the mechanics of a good maintenance plan and, mm. and then maybe talk about how that's evolved over time? Okay. I had the traditional maintenance plan everybody else had back uh, over 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And that was, you know, priority service, uh, discounts, um, um, a few other things that you throw in there, right? Um, 32 point checkup. You know, and I thought about that when we had this revelation in 2010, and I said, what does the customer really get out of that? And what do they perceive that they get? What do the customers want? Well, they want you to keep their, their system running, right? Then they want to extend the useful life of the system. And then they want priority service, but they want it specified in time frames. Um, and, and the other thing is uh, they want guarantees, and they want, they don't want to be hassled on little stuff. So way back when I changed uh, a lot of the aspects of my agreements to 
include, for instance, on my very premium plan, it's a four hour guaranteed response time. The customers can assign value to that. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And what are we doing? We're putting our money where our mouth is saying you're more important than that COD customer calling in. Mm-hmm. Right. Because if we, if we show them that they're the priority, we will be the priority. So we, we do four hour response time, we do same day on our regular plans, same day guarantee. Um, we include uh, up to two pounds of Freon is included in the plan. I mean, think about that. Yep. Customers can equate a value of Freon and how many uh, times a co- company comes out and they put in a pound of Freon, they don't even do a leak search, you know, and they'll charge them $220 and w- walk back out the door, yep. right? So if you sign an agreement with us, uh, we take the onus of making sure we do a leak search and finding the source of the leak if it's because I'm not going to I'm not going to go out there and keep pumping in Freon. Um, we want to find a leak. And why would we send the leakers to our competition anyway? So we include that we include um, filters for life. Um, when we sell a new system, or if a customer joins us, we uh, we put a, a permanent side filter with sponge media. So we 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 bring out six pads. So we, we don't want to be hassled with filters you know, trying to find filters, we, we provide the filters. So yeah, these things have a cost, but you build that into your, into your cost structure. That's why we're not an inexpensive agreement. So I want to go back to something real quick. Um, you said something I thought was key and is really important for our listeners to know, and it is your, what the perceived value is versus what the actual value is. Because you know, I think what you can, what a lot of contractors can misunderstand is like, but they're getting all of these things, but the customer may not really have a clue what the value of that actually is, nor do they care about it or even know. So I think there is two key components there that you have to make sure that, you know, that it's, it's really about what they, what the perceived value is by the homeowner that I think makes the agreement most valuable to start because they have to really understand like, okay, great. What's two pounds of free on mean like what does that even really but they have to understand that to know like oh yeah okay there is real value because they're trying to attach some sort of dollar amount or um like you said the key ingredient to is, is like the four hour or even same day service i love those things because it's an immediate service and that's what people want is to be taken care of now like convenience and it's right speed is a necessity type of thing so those are two key things um i want to um actually ask this question for the naysayers Okay, because those who are like, there's nothing that you're going to say, Jamie, even though you've proven that they, there's so much success in utilizing these maintenance memberships, or these maintenance agreements, is there's other, those that are like, nah, that doesn't work here. Or, nope, I know that. Or nope, I tried that. What, um, you know, what are some of these myths that people have come up with or that they think, you know, that, you know, they, they would disagree with, you know, maintenance agreements are successful. Like, what are some things that you've heard that people are like, you know, what are those? You know what I'm talking about? Like, what is the myth? of, you know, service agreements? Well, uh, it's certain, uh, I've heard these before from, like you said, naysayers or people who are doubters, let's just call them doubters, doubters that, works. Um, that they're, um, they're difficult to administrate, right? I, I can't, I can't keep them. They, they come in and they go out, um, or I have to hire people to manage them properly. Um, so they, they cost too much. They're too much effort for the amount of money that you're getting. So, um, people assign a, uh, and, and this is a business owners. Business owners are looking for ROI on almost everything, right? Mm-hmm. So if you had a hundred and eighty-five dollar maintenance agreement, and your tech sold uh, one on every single repair, okay, and then but his average ticket was low. Most owners would be like, "You suck. <laughs> you got a low average ticket," but they ignore the fact that they're building a base for that owner and for their fellow team members that's going to carry them on into the future they're looking short-sighted and right it's it's what, what am i getting today versus what am i doing today that's going to get me something tomorrow and i think that's the thing they look at the agreement as a standalone accessory right when it's not an accessory it's actually the most valuable part of your company i mean and here you know let's take it to the broader business world uh netflix um, is not uh, valued based on their revenue per se. What's their big value? Is their monthly, their their subscriptions, right? They, 
companies are valued based on subscriptions and it's going to move in that direction. Sure. We, you know, acquires pay on EBITDA. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's, they're going to start, the multiples are going to start after this crazy time gets, <laughs> we get past this frenzy, right. all right? The multiples are going to adjust to where uh, acquirers are going to say, well, what is the chances of longevity in this business versus another business? If I have a $20 million business that says 15,000 maintenance agreements and I have a $20 million business that has 2,000 maintenance agreements, which one will fall off the wagon first? in a recession or in a cool summer or in a warm winter. It's going to be, they're going to start calculating in the fact that the company that retains their customers the longer usually is an indication they retain their employees longer. So that's good. there is that intrinsic value that's going to come up. So uh, agreements are far more valuable than most HVAC plumbing owners give them credit for. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And you talked a moment ago about a technician who sells, you know, 50 versus someone who sells 200. What are the difference other than, of course, one believes in it and one doesn't, but how do you train them and how do you instill a culture of believing and executing and securing maintenance contracts? Well, um, first I got to get them to understand the value that, uh, that the customers perceive because technicians, they don't perceive the value of what they're charging a lot of times right at a, at a tech school. They're like, we're charging how much for this uh, $11 contactor? What? So it's teaching them the pricing model is really important for them to understand that they only bill about 30% of their time. What's happening the other 70% of the time? Well, that's got to be recovered in the 30% of the time you do bill. So that's the first thing is really train them. Don't, don't keep them out of the books. Let them into the books. Um, and, and let them also see what the value of that customer is. And I, I took a three-year time frame. 2013, 2014, 2015, and I analyzed the revenue generated from my loyal customers, those that had agreements prior to that time frame. So they had agreements for at least three years going into that. And then customers that never had an agreement and customers that don't have an agreement anymore work, agreement customers, not agreement customers. So when I measured that in, um, in 2014, after the 2015 year, really, I just gave it to this data scientist and they just crunched numbers. Give me the revenue of all my agreement customers in 2015, 2014, 2013 in, in these three buckets, the loyal customers, the ex-loyal customers, and the, the non-loyal customers. The, uh, the loyal customers, well, I'll, I'll start with the, ex, the uh, non-loyal customers, were about $637. The ex-loyal customers were about 690. So they used to be, have agreements, not agreements, but they still use us, right? So about 690. The loyal customers, those uh, customers who have been under plan for three years or more, $1,600. So customer A, B, C, it's two and a half times or two and three quarters times the size of revenue per customer. So I present that to the employees and say, listen, here's what, what the data shows. Let me ask you this. When you go into a customer who's been with us three, four years, and you met him for the first time, say somebody else met him before, is that a different feeling than walking into another customer for the first time ever? And they absolutely know it. I said, well, wh wh what do you want to, what type of environment do you want to be in? And they all agree that going to a customer's house that knows us, and knows them is a much more pleasant experience. Of course, yeah. But if you don't build that, if you don't have the mechanism to build that. So I really teach them on the intrinsic value to them, right? Mm -hmm. It's a value to the customer. We all know that. It's a value to them and it's a value to the company. Well, though, that's the that's the winning triangle, right? What about tactics or techniques to have them communicate in the home and then demonstrate. So, you know, demonstrate the value so that they can actually get someone to sign up. Like, is, is that hard? No, um, no it's not difficult. Um, and what I always uh, tell them is to show them what a maintenance, uh, what, what a maintenance coverage does, but also show them the value of built in and what things were covered. If you, a lot of the times they'll go out and I'm okay with this. If they can use 
um, whatever, like you said, tactics, if they go out there and a customer needs a pound of Freon, okay, um, they'll pay us for the leak check, you know, 99 bucks. But I say, if they buy an agreement, don't charge them for the pound of Freon. They'll see that, hey, that's $149 for that pound of Freon, $185 agreement. That's a good, good, you know, yeah. a good balance, yeah. yep. right? Yeah. But don't sell just on that. You have to go through the brochure. We have a trifold. You go through the brochure, show the other things that they're going to get. You take a measurement for their filters, tell them they're going to get filters for life as long as they keep it going, right? So we we try to build enough value where our renewal rate stays above 70%. Right now, we're running about 76% renewals. That's on an annual basis? Yes. And do you build... Do people like to pay monthly or pay annually? What's that look like? Most of our people here like to pay annually. And I don't know if it's, we're in Sarasota, Tampa, South Florida, Naples, a little bit older. They're not real um, open to giving out credit cards or <laughs> uh, younger people are pretty good at that. I, I'm older. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those people who say, I'll just pay now. I'll pay with a credit card now, but don't keep my credit card and charge it monthly. Yep. So, but we have about, probably about 1200 monthlies. Gotcha. I can see you driving around Sarasota collecting up, you know, $16 and 50 cents a month from a couple of thousand people. <laughs> yeah. They, they forget, they, they forget to renew their credit cards. I mean, <laughs> have you found a, um, that's a really good point, by the way, have, have you found a sweet spot price point? I know you mentioned you have a premium level. What's your standard? And and you mentioned $185. Is that like a, a median? Yeah, that's a medium. Uh, we have a uh, $399 plan that includes all three trades, it includes that four hour response time, includes filters, has a lot of, you know, a lot of plumbing added value, electrical added value, GFI circuits, GFI uh, plugs, um, stuff like that. So um, we throw in a lot of, of value added in that 399. And then uh, we have a, a, a Oh, I guess it's AC only 199 or 185. I think it's 199 now. And then we have another one uh, for 129, and that's for customers who just got a new AC put in. What I found was is customers got price sensitive when they realized they weren't getting the value of some of them. Like they weren't getting um, uh, they they have a warranty, right? So they weren't getting the discounts mean nothing to them, right? So you give them a lower price thing, a uh, lower price agreement, it satisfies the uh, the manufacturer carrier in this instance, and they're, they're very strict on uh, keeping ongoing maintenance. So we satisfy that. And the other thing is we, we make sure their unit is running to factory specs three, four, five years later. Mm-hmm. And, um, but they can see staying on that plan. It's like 10 bucks a month. So it's something they can very well afford. Got it. And, have you had any experience with more creative ways of like bundling in the, um, you know, the labor warranties and, you know, I, I know there's some leasing options out there. Anything going on in that space? We are looking at a leasing uh, partnership. We've been working on a leasing partnership for, um, for equipment. And, um, you know, I think that's just another channel. I, I think our, our business is coming, becoming more and more complex, um, even from a marketing perspective with all different <laughs> channels out there and, and trying to acquire cu- customers. It's not only channels of marketing, but it's channels of products. So leasing is something we definitely have started to delve into. Um, uh, the other things we're looking at, and Florida has a lot of regulations, so I have to get special licensing for things like selling a five-year maintenance plan. Um, that, that's something that I think I would like to start doing is multi-year uh, agreement sales. Um, so those are the things we're looking at from a from a new launching standpoint. We have to constantly innovate because you know things get stale after a while. So um, that, that 2021 is going to be some more innovations planned. Yeah, we had a um, we had a, a previous guest on um, Ian McKee and Tom Tao from Service First Finance, right, Paul? Mm-hmm. Financial, yep. Yeah. Um, because of the because of this whole leasing topic that had come up and. Um, it was real. I mean, I was super intrigued by that and I'd never really even paid much attention to it in the last decade, honestly, um, with the exception of our Canada customers. But, um, yeah, like it, it was certainly intriguing. Like I can see how 
it being an option could work. I mean, this industry, like you said, is getting more complex and hard, not only for you guys, but for us as well. Yeah. Um, which is why I'm so thankful. It's been 13 years of only focusing on the trade. So I only got to chase technology. Um, but I completely agree. You constantly have to kind of try and do something more than the next guy. And that's not easy. Yeah. But the interesting have- thing is for your listeners, this is something that is a, not a competitive issue. I, you know, people wonder, why do you share so much about agreements? I said, because they're my customers in the first place. Right. I've marketed yeah. for them. We know how much we spend to acquire them. What is it? Three, four, five hundred dollars to get them through the door. Why shouldn't I try to w- find a way to lock them in? And if we prove ourselves a, a maintenance visit after maintenance visit, it's and I've and it's proven once a customer's been on our agreement three years, you have to really chase them off. Yeah. Whereas most of most of my peers will say it's they usually get that BBB complaint from that one time right. customer diagnostic only with a quote that they didn't like. So they went on a BBB and just slammed them. Right. Um, these customers don't do that to us. Mm-hmm. They give us the benefit of the doubt. And guess what? When they're unhappy, they're going to call us. They're not going to go away and write some bad review. So um, they actually go out of their way to write great reviews. Yeah. And if you look at, if you look at our Google yeah, reviews, like- we're well over 5,000 yeah. uh, Google reviews with a 4.98 rating just on air conditioning. Yeah, I think we've got 1,700 on plumbing and like a 800 or 900 on um, electrical. Yeah, so you're, you're actually almost at 6,000 just on the HVAC side of things at a 4.9. Like I was looking that up. I, I always believe that that tells the, the story beyond what you say or I say. Like that tells the story on what yeah. the actual service is. Yes. And I don't believe in big rewards for my employees. I think they got five bucks for a positive <laughs> online review. Five bucks is five bucks. Five bucks, man. That's your job. Do you <laughs> do you have any key measures or KPIs around percentage of revenue related to actual billing of maintenance agreements that you try to target? Not revenue from maintenance agreement clients, which I hear is the larger majority, but like just some, some general KPIs around maintenance agreements, got it. service good. agreements. That's good. We really just focus on, on the measurements of growth. Um, who's, who's mm-hmm. selling them, what, the, what the conversion rate in the field. I know service Titan has got that in built into their system and they've had some trouble of uh, perfecting it because it was looking at the wrong data points, but I think they've gotten it nailed down. So uh, we look for a uh, 50% conversion rate for HVAC agreements, 30% for plumbing and 20% for electrical. Um, that's what, so every time, uh, a technician gets an opportunity on HVAC, I expect them to convert them half the time. And if they're way below that, you know, it's an opportunity for coaching, training, adjusting beliefs, so on and so forth. Um, so the conversion rate is very important. Um, the numbers, uh, sold for the month, the numbers not renewed for the month, overall growth, and then overall retention rate. If you do those, you know, four or five data points, you're really measuring uh, what you need to know. But most companies aren't even measuring three data points. So um, if you start measuring it, you could start learning uh, a lot about your, the habits of your company in regards to that. The, the thing that I am going to start measuring, and this is my 2021 initiative, is the average length of time my customers stay under agreement. So, for instance, if I have 20,000 agreements... I have uh, an average length of time of 3.8 years or 5.7 years or, um, and then look at the standard deviation to say, you know, half of them have had more than five years, right? So why is that important? Well, number one, that gives you, uh, it gives you how good you're doing once you're there under agreement, right? You know, you're doing a great job. The, the non-renewals you get in a 25% non-renewals, well, in Florida, some of it's moving away, usually to assisted living. Some of it's passing away. Uh, and, and then the rest is probably, we did not fulfill their expectations. Right. But Mm -hmm. if, if I sold, if there was an average, um, uh, retention time, those customers only like less than a year or two and they left us, I'm okay with that. Right. Mm -hmm. What bothers me is the customers that have been with us more than five years and they're leaving us. Mm -hmm. Right. Because those are the ones that generate that, that high average revenue rate. The ones that under under three years, you know, they're still getting to know us. So 
that's the, the, the next data point I'm going to build on. And, and since joining Wrench, they're really good at that. They can, they, they'll help me with that. I, I love that you, um, and this is actually something that I don't believe a lot of people do. This is something that we do at Rhino as well. Um, I'm super grateful. Let me just say this first off, that we have a extremely high retention rate. We don't have a lot of turnover of customers, but we're also not trying to work with everybody. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on our small group of customers and helping them grow. They grow, we grow. That being said, there's certainly turnover. Like there's people that might have changed manufacturers. They get a different deal from manufacturer that it's not a partner of ours and they leave or whatever, sell their business. That's happened a lot this year. <laughs> um, but we like to do exit interviews on why are you leaving? Like, what did we do wrong? And what you said was that you're tracking when people are becoming, you know, non-membership customers is you're, you're, it's equally as important to understand why people are leaving to know if there's a hole or a gap or something needs to be fixed. Like you mentioned someone to assisted living because of the demographic of, of where you're at. Um, some people passing away or maybe leaving and going to compete, whatever it is. It's good to track that information and ask that question. It's easy to just be like, well, if they left and let it go. But really, you need to put in that extra effort and start to find out why to stop the bleeding if there's bleeding. Um, because like, it might be different for your demographic because of, because of them being older, but not everybody has that scenario. Some of it could just be like, hey, you didn't fulfill this. Um, they were unhappy. Right. So I'm right. loving to do that. You got to find out what, what, where we're falling short. And that's how you get better, right? Certainly. It's, it's, it's fine-tuning. You know, it's, it's a fine tuning. You get into, uh, you get into a $50 million size revenue operation. 1% is meaningful. Mm-hmm. Very meaningful. Yep. Yeah. I believe the best of the best do that. And you don't have, to, it doesn't take, uh, it, you don't have to have money to do that. To Correct. Do that process. Yeah. We, we started that a long time ago when we were like two and a half million. So, so no excuses. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So when you, when you started in the business, you started in an accounting function and then kind of moved your way into other areas, but is accounting still your core? Because I hear a, uh, I hear that in your, in the way you communicate. Here we go. Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm a CPA. Uh, I passed it the <laughs> first it time. There we go. <laughs> um, but I was uh, accounting itself as a, as a career wasn't my my passion. I love dealing with operational people when I was in accounting to help them get better by providing information. So when I when I communicate, lots of times I'll communicate in figures. Um, but I really, uh, don't like to dwell on it. I just, I just like to try to get the, some basic figures tracking and then I don't like to go too deep into statistics. I'm not, I'm not your typical accountant. Yeah. But that's a, that's a strength for sure. You might've just became Paul's mentor, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul is our VP of sales at, at Rhino, but he's actually, not really a sales guy, which is I think what makes him so exceptional right. is that he, one, he's a genuine guy because he genuinely cares about the customer, but he actually thinks um, a far more methodical about, you know, what's the best case scenario for this guy. They're wanting to bring in X amount of new leads, but they're only exercising company. So I've, uh, I appreciate that about you, Paul. I know you have that like CPA underlying background to that financial background that makes you successful, but I think that those are extremely important roles. I've totally forgot did you did you listen to to Jamie's Service Titan webinar, Paul? I did not. So, because you did talk about that on that webinar, I just now remembered that whenever you had brought it up. So I knew that he was going to say yeah. CPA. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, CPA stands for can't pass again. <laughs> well, it it reminds me of our um, you know our kind of strategic <laughs> partnership with Gary Vaynerchuk, his number two guy who runs his organization. They call him Jimmy the Pencil because he's a former accounting guy because nothing gets past him. But he's evolved into such, you know, much more kind of dynamic leadership role. But at the end of the day, the numbers don't lie. You know, he's and he's <laughs> relentless. So like as big as VaynerMedia, you know, is today at 300 million or whatever, they're, wherever they're at. Um, Jimmy still reaches out to me and is like, hey, how are we doing in this year? Because <laughs> we have a partnership with him, right? So there's <laughs> there's a little bit there. Yeah. He's like on me about it. And, and he... Is it like he's got plenty of staff, but he he cares that much. But he's a, he's a numbers guy, man. Jimmy the pencil is no joke, and he is a very uh, smart human being, and he's been very great for our business. That's great. So congratulations. Um, well, we are about uh, gosh about forty five minutes in or so. Is that right, Kyle? Um, so I want to get to a couple of other questions too before we uh, we start to segue out of this thing too. But um, you know, I think what's really important is. Uh, 
for our listeners is to understand um, maybe they don't have an offering that's as robust as yours. Um, you can start somewhere. Just start with something, right? And and you had, you had said something that um, we've heard a lot, and it's that people are saying, why do you share these things, Jamie? Uh, um, and here's the reality is that most, and I hope that I hope that, that this is not true or it's not as true as it has been, but most aren't going to do it anyway. Like you could share every detail of every package that you've gotten that you're offering, but the effort to implement that, train that, and then stick to it is pretty significant. Um, but it's that important to your business, so you should do it. But you know that most just aren't like, you know, most probably aren't going to do those things. That being said, if there's some basics that somebody can do right now that are simple, let's just say they're, you know, I mean, I know you're, you're HVAC plumbing and electrical, but let's just say they're, you know, single service. Um, what's like a, the basic things they got to do and they should start offering now that's like the simplest thing to implement if you can really answer that i don't know that that can well, actually I, i'm, I'm going to say you got to have you got to have a plan you got to have a, an agreement plan and I, I always like to have two at least two and let me tell you why because customers love choices sure when you're offering one thing if they feel automatically there's a little bit okay it's th- this or nothing right right and maybe they want something more so offer something a robust plan with a lot of added value and a basic plan and if you do that and then the other thing is make sure your people believe in it. And that means in order for them to believe something, you better start believing in it first. And if you don't believe in it, you're not the right person. Assign somebody in your company to believe in it. Not every owner is going to believe in the best things for their company, but recognize that somebody has to really believe in it. Somebody's got a champion. Yep. You got some owners and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll be, uh, I'll be a little prejudicial here, but you have some owners who started out as technicians um, they don't like salespeople. Sure. They can't manage salespeople. They can't communicate with salespeople and they hire somebody to run their salespeople and their company becomes highly successful because that person knows how to manage salespeople and get results out of salespeople. So if you want to grow your customer relationships, assign a chief customer relationship person. And that person, they're the advocate for the customer. They're going to tick off your manager sometimes, but they're going to make sure that their that that five ten year customer uh, maintenance agreement holder is taken care of, and I like to compare my company and I say this to my people with American Express. You know, you know, you have different levels of cards with American Express, and you know, you get to a gold card, you get some benefits, platinum, you get benefits, and there's the black, right? Um, but the people, even people with the green cards, get certain benefits, right? And they always thank you for being a member since so and so. And they're always your advocate against a vendor. That's why I like to put things on American Express. I have less problems when somebody tries Same. to screw me, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I like the fact that American Express really does hold the customer value relationship very high. And um, so you need to have uh, a focus on customer retention. And you can't just say, uh, we do a great job retaining customers, but nobody can give me a number on what they retain. And if you're retaining 50 customers over the last 10 years, I don't think you're going anywhere. Everybody else is coming in and out. You may have those 50, but everybody else is coming in and out. So you have to have a philosophy of customer longevity and retention. And when you do that, you're there for when they need a new air conditioning unit. You're there when they need uh, a new duct system. You're there when they need a new water heater. You're there when they need a new panel change out. You just want to be there. You want to be the relationship when they have those needs. Yeah. I, um, I believe that it also has to like, we hit, I'm going to hit on this again, that if you're a technician and you started your own business, which is a lot of you know companies who were techs that dropped off and did their own thing. Um, sure. Not really, entrepreneurs, maybe more, you know, they just trying to do the job and get it done. And there's no real plan in place. And and I'm not hating on that at all. So I'm just saying that I think that's a lot of um, my experiences have been companies that started that way. So they look for information just like this podcast to help themselves become better business owners. But you have to understand number one is perceived value by the customer. Like, cause that's how you're going to have mm-hmm. to offer those up is that perceived value, not your knowledge as the technician or the owner, but the value to that homeowner is what matters more. Correct. So perfect example, 
Let me give you a good example, Jamie, and you'll appreciate this because you guys have, you know, you guys have, you do so much different marketing. Is in our world, um, it's almost like NFL. I always say NFL, like, or I've heard NFL means not for long. Like, you know, <laughs> you, like, I don't even want to talk about Arizona Cardinals right now because they're letting me down so bad. Um, and they've got so many weapons. But, um, man, you can be, throw a Hail Mary pass to DeAndre Hopkins and he makes a catch in a Buffalo Bills game and we're great and then we lose four straight. You're only as good as that last play. For us as a digital marketing company, we're really only as good as that season, like that, sometimes even that net, that previous month. And because we're reporting every cost per lead for every brand new customer, for every service lead, every install lead, every drain cleaning lead, down every month, it's pretty transparent to you or to our customer exactly where we stand because their perceived value on, hey, we might have done 500 things on the back end and they have no clue, but we're like, hey, we did all these things. All they care about is what did you do for me? How many new customers did you bring me? What mm-hmm. was the revenue that came from it out of my pulling out of my service Titan? Because inevitably somebody will go to the service Titan or house carport or whatever they're using and just look at closed revenue, not the actual opportunity that was mm-hmm. missed. But it's right. our job to make sure that they understand here's not only what we did, but here was the outcome of what we did and the value to you. This is the same thing. You have mm-hmm. to make sure that the homeowners understand the value of having the service agreement that's mm-hmm. important to them. I'm a fan also in, in of, of uh, the annual payment option because I also think if somebody's being hit with that payment every single month, there might be a month where they're like, wait, well, what the hell am I keep paying for this thing for? Like, I also think there's value um, um, on the retention side of things of the one hit, you know, a year option yeah. too. So, I mean, I, I don't know if, I'm sure you guys have had those conversations before in the past about like, do we hit monthly? Do we hit annually? It's almost like, I don't believe in any single, single uh, application of how to collect the money. I think the monthly payment was great. Is great for people who want convenience, and and then also maybe a hundred and two hundred dollars sounds too high to them at that point. Sure. So yep. eighteen dollars a month sounds so much better. Yeah. Um, so they're okay, you know just breaking it down, breaking it down for the customer into more simple terms. But you're right. Um, it, it, the customer derives value from their home service provider, really at times when they need them most. When you're on the maintenance visit, that's about building and maintaining and growing the relationship. And then the value part of it is number one, and I tell this to my customers, I don't want them calling me between April and September. I want everybody else's customers calling me between April and September that they don't do great maintenance for because their stuff's breaking down, right? Yep. So we want to make sure our customers are running when the system is at its highest use. And in Arizona, you know, it's the same as Florida. Yep. April to September, and this year, probably October. October, yep. (laughs) Those systems are running, running, running. So I don't think it's a win when a customer uh, has a breakdown and has a maintenance-related item in July. Agreed. A contactor. We should have caught that in February when we did the maintenance or in March. And did that Why take away? Did, you, did that take away? Why you in July? Yep. You know, but it leaves me room in my labor pool to take on new customers. Yep. Makes perfect sense. So yeah. it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. We actually hit from like here in Phoenix from say March to October this year. It's been a long summer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a long summer. Yes. Yeah. It's hot and dry. I think that a lot of times people will ask me if I'm involved, you know, typically if I'm involved with a one-on-one conversation with the contractor anymore, it's typically a, um, you know, maybe a bigger customer. I mean, we have a lot of private equity that comes to us always trying to like look for <laughs> our customers mm-hmm. that fit X, you know, range. Yeah. But um, the most competitive markets, South Florida, South Texas, mm-hmm. you know, Arizona, Southern California. Yeah. Um, I will say I'm grateful that even through COVID, this has been a phenomenal year for business yeah. on a couple fronts. One, just from those that actually didn't pull back and stuck with it and doubled down, there was significant growth. People were home more. Like you mm-hmm. could have easily, like your intuition should have told you that people are going to be home more. You should have kept going. Like regardless here in Phoenix, it's 110 degrees outside. Uh, if your air conditioning breaks, there's only so much that fan's going to do. And then it's 110 degrees outside. You know, you, we don't get humidity like you guys get that nasty humidity too, but like people don't want to be hot. Well, 
you know, you got to do something. So, of course, you keep putting yourself out there. But then, of course, you know, it also exposed that. Guess what? We're uh, pandemic proof. <laughs> We're recession proof. We're pandemic proof, you know, like, because heating and air conditioning is not going to go away. It's always going to be right. a thing. Plumbing. Last thing you want to do is it be 110 degrees, your plumbing and air conditioning go out and you got a hot, stinky house. Like, you got to got, you have to get a hatchback of the plumbing guy in there. Oh, yeah. I got to ask you this question, Jamie. So, I heard, we, we did a podcast. This is like completely left field, but it just made me think of it. Have you ever heard, because you're in the plumbing business, so you, if you don't say yes, oh then my. I'm going to believe that this, Unbelievable. yep, this is where it's going. So, I heard uh, on a podcast with a, was it was it with our with the PR agency? Uh, yep, Heather Ripley PR. Shout out Ripley PR. Um, that when I was asking them like the benefits of being you know using a PR agency regardless of size of company, she had told us that they were writing stories around a uh, around um, like thanks just after Thanksgiving that Friday. So you know you've got like Black Friday, you've got Small Business Saturday, you've got Cyber Monday. It was called Brown Friday for plumbers. Have you ever heard that term at all? Uh, yes, I have. So. <laughs> I never but knew. We're that. very busy on thank, the day after Thanksgiving. <laughs> sure, okay. So that's a thing. It's a really a thing. It's a thing. Yes. Unbelievable. That was episode 47, by the way, uh, with Heather Ripley. So I had never heard that in my 13 years of working in the trades. Ever have heard of that. I don't know if I would market that. But, <laughs> well, but that's what it, I yeah, mean. That's tricky. what I mean. Like, why? Because it's, yeah, I don't know how you would market that. So when it came up, I was like, was it a joke? She didn't, kind of, didn't really seem like the joking type, but I was like, clearly that's got to be it. I mean, I took it as like, a, that's funny. Ha ha. I would never, ever market that. <laughs> like, how would you market that? Anyhow, yeah, exactly. It's just one of those things that it's like, it's like, uh, we'll have a lot of, of uh, heating air conditioning companies that are servicing like grow rooms and stuff for, because there's so much legalized marijuana, but they don't want to ever market it. They just want to go and take care of the customers because it's really good business. Um, yeah. This is kind of like that in the plumbing Good cash business. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I know that, um, I know that you're super, um, thoughtful and giving back and helping others. And I really appreciate that you're like that. I mean, like I, I always believe, you know, uh, and I say this often, you know, rising tide raises all ships. Um, and I believe that, um, you know, you've done a good job of helping others and I appreciate you coming on here and, and I, and I'm super grateful that you spend the time with us, um, and share the information and the knowledge and the things that you've used and learned. The hope is if you're listening, if you're taking down, you know, notes or, or, um, you know, putting anything in your phone or, you know, taking mental note, whatever it is, um, you got to actually do something with it. Yes. Um, if yeah. not, you just wasted your time. Okay. And, and here's the thing, just by you, if you're listening right now, just by you taking action and doing something that Jamie just told you, who's clearly been successful with this, just by doing something, you just put yourself ahead of significantly more of your peers by actually doing something. Think about that. All you got to do is implement something that Jamie told you that, that now puts you ahead of some of your competitors. Wouldn't you say it's yeah. a fact, Jamie? Yes. You, I, I couldn't have said any better than that. Just do something. It's most of the time if I'm talking to somebody and you know, they call me and I give them some tips and I talk to them six months later, what have you done? I said, well, I haven't gotten to it. I've been too busy, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, you're never going to, if you never get to it, it'll never get done. You got to get something. You got to eat the elephant one bite at a time. That's right. That's so right. you start somewhere. Maybe it starts with just putting a plan to get, putting a plan together and do, and doing the print creative, right? Um, and my recommendation is, you know, if you're if you're a, co a company with over twenty employees, you probably should have a marketing partner, somebody do your marketing already because it's that critical um, to have somebody helping you with marketing, even when you're only like you know. Uh, a couple million, two, three million dollars in size, um, you guys can scale to any size and um, help. That helps you take your your mind off of chasing customers. They help you bring the customers in. You focus on retaining. As a CEO, I don't want to, I don't want to have to go out and fish for fifty million dollars worth of new customers every year. That's stressful, <laughs> right? I want to know I'm going to have a bulk of that roll in, like thirty million of it just through retention of my base yep. and I have to fish for 25 million. So that's, to me, that's a lot. It's a, it takes a lot of pressure off of my marketing partner and, and uh, my marketing budget. Yeah. It's certainly easier to build a business with that retention model, with that retainer type of model. Yep. I mean, we literally have built this company without marketing ourselves on that model. 
Um, we've been debt free since day one. I've never owed anybody a dime. So I've never made a, a financial decision based off of fear. Um, I've always done it based on what's best for the customer. And I believe if you continue to chase that customer methodology, put your KPIs in place, mm-hmm. the revenue will follow you, be successful. But having that retention, you know, that retainer model, the membership model certainly makes a lot of sense to me uh, because it's, you know, at least you can bank on that. You know, even if you're a high, you know, if you're a big warrior, you have anxiety, it certainly makes it a lot less um, when you've got that, you know, that constant revenue to, to bank on every year. And, and then, so that's why I think this is such an important topic. I wanted to have you on. Um, and I've been thinking about this for months. I mean, you probably did that webinar two, three months ago, somewhere around there, I don't know, maybe even longer. So we try to get this thing locked down a few times. I'm glad I got you on by the end of the year. I'm not sure exactly when this episode will post. I think this actually might be at the beginning of the year. Is that right, Kyle? Um, so, which is great news because listen, um, I'm always jacked up for the beginning of the year because you start at zero, you are at (laughs) straight flat zero. Um, and I love that Mm -hmm. because I'm such a competitive guy and I love to see what we do through the end of the year. But now the years are flying by like this year was a weird one. It was an odd year, a crazy year. We learned a lot. Um, I learned that, uh, I'm very grateful that we tracked everything. I also learned a valuable lesson that if your brand wasn't on point and constantly out there, like you really need to make sure that, you know, I mean, I'm talking about this from my customer's perspective. Um, you, if you weren't paying attention to cash flow, you are this year, you were after this year, yeah. you know, um, we've seen a lot of customers that we were able to kind of uncover that for them, but making sure your brand is on point. That being said, this was a great year. I'm grateful that we uh, that we are a uh, pandemic-proof business. And so 2021, if you're listening right now, um, utilize this as your springboard, if you haven't already, to get it in gear, right? You're right at the beginning of the year. Like, everything is new, all right? Gloves off. It's time to bare knuckle, whoop some ass of 2021, and start to implement things into your business. It's not too late. Jamie, I appreciate you so much. Hey, Congratulations, man, on the partnership. I mean, the this you know now your new partnership really with Wrench Group and and the success you had getting there. Um, man, I have so much respect for you in the industry, and uh, and I think that um, you know what you've been offering up on these webinars and the podcasts and things is so great, and it's super indicative of the human being that you are. I appreciate you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys too, Paul. Any parting words from you, buddy? No, just so nice to meet you and and conversations like this always re-energize us. We always learn a ton from it. And most importantly, we're inspired. So that means our listeners will be inspired. So take some action because ambition without action, Chris, is what? It's absolutely useless. Listeners, go crush 2021. Let's go. Hey, listeners, producer Kyle here. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of To The Point. We want to try something new. This year, at the end of every episode... We're going to be highlighting reviews that you leave us. We would appreciate you checking out our podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, leave us a review in the App Store for your chance to be featured on the next episode of To The Point. Till next time, kick some ass.